<laughs> all right. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you uh, to our um, Center for South Asian and Indian Ocean Studies uh, lecture series. Um, uh, I'd like to begin by thanking uh, Fiza Shazad and Amrita Jain, our graduate uh, assistants uh, for the Center for South Asian and Indian Ocean Studies. Without them, uh, this would be impossible to put together. So many, many thanks. Um, we're very fortunate to have with us today um, Dr. Chandra Malampali. Um, uh, who did his doctorate uh, at uh, Madison, Wisconsin. He just told me uh, 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 with, with Frickenberg. Um, and uh, uh, so it's really, uh, and he said he's one of the last students of, of, of Bob Frickenberg. So wonderful uh, experience. Um, uh, Dr. Malampali is uh, the holder of um, the Fletcher Jones uh, Foundation Chair uh, of the Social Sciences at Westmont College, uh, and he teaches uh, South Asian history. Um, he's the author of several books and articles uh, looking at the nexus uh, of religion, law, um, and, and, and society in colonial South India. He's currently working, he's currently actually um, uh, a Yang visiting scholar uh, at the Harvard Divinity School, uh, and which is the reason why we've been able to uh, bring him across. Um, and he's working on a book called South Asia's Christians, uh, between Hindu and Muslim, uh, which I think is a fascinating uh, way to, to approach the, the problem because they're certainly not isolated. Uh, uh, and so uh, he's been working on that. Uh, and I, I, I assume that your talk is uh, drawing upon the new work, uh, the confusion about conversion. Um, uh, please join me in warmly welcoming uh, Dr. Malampali um, to Tats. Oh, well, thank you so much, Professor Jalal, for uh, the kind introduction and for the invitation to contribute to this uh, lecture series. Um, great to be in person. Uh, great to be talking face to face after a long drought from face to face conversations and ODing on Zoom. But hello to all you Zoom folks, uh, regardless. I going to be talking about conversion today, but not simply uh, Christian conversion, but also anti-Christian violence attached to Christian conversion, which has been getting a great deal of attention in not only Indian media, but global media as well. Uh, it's also the topic of many scholarly books and articles. Uh, last semester at Harvard, I taught a seminar, a semester-length seminar on religious conversion in South Asia, and we hardly even scratched the surface with uh, the newspaper articles and the books and things. So much is coming out um, every year on this topic. We had a working definition of conversion, uh, conversion as an event or process resulting in a change in religious affiliation, beliefs, and practices in an individual and group. Obviously, the definitions exist to stretch them and to problematize them. Uh, in relation to conversion, uh, a big question that's often asked is conversion uh, best treated as a noun or as a verb? And if it is a verb, is it a transitive verb, uh, one that has an object? So conversion is something that you do to somebody else. You convert her to Christianity. Or is it an intransitive or somebody uh, converted? Uh, in which case the agency is with the convert uh, and the latter, uh, the former, the agency is with someone who is converting. So um, this is also uh, a topic that generates different perspectives from actors on the ground. Uh, you can look at conversion from the convert's point of view. You can look at conversion from the perspective of the minister or the preacher who's accused of converting forcibly or with inducements or whatever the case may be. The FIRs filed by police contain the narrative, the narration of events associated with conversion. And of course, you also have uh, the perspective of those who, who commit attacks on churches and uh, who will allege that some sort of fraudulent or forcible conversion is taking place inside the church that justifies the attack. There is uh, also a debate in conversion literature about uh, whether um, conversion is a virtue or a vice. Um, conversion can be seen as a natural expression of the missionary impulse of a salvation religion. Uh, and, uh, a process of sharing 
a message of salvation, of, of emancipation or hope with people. Uh, on the contrary, conversion can be seen as a siege on somebody else, an act of violence, uh, a colonization of consciousness of someone else. And that is uh, a phrase that is taken up in an article by Nathaniel Roberts, the anthropologist, is conversion a colonization of consciousness uh, in a way that uh, offsets the autonomy of the individual in some way. So these are all a part of the uh, vexing uh, confusion associated with conversion. Gauri Vishwanathan um, in her book Outside the Fold says conversion is arguably one of the most unsettling events in the life of a society because of the way it challenges fixed identities around which notions of selfhood, citizenship, nation and community are built. That's all fine and good, but why do we presume that these notions are as fixed as uh, as she says they are, and who says that they are so fixed that they should be policed to prevent any sort of change occurring in the life of a nation, a community, an individual, and uh, so forth. A similar uh, ambiguity surrounds the concept of religious freedom. For some, uh, religious freedom is the freedom to propagate religion, uh, according to the language of Article 25, of the Indian Constitution, which guarantees the right to profess, propagate, and practice religion. But increasingly, uh, advocates, uh, the activists of the San Paribar have portrayed religious freedom as freedom not to be converted, freedom uh, to be protected from persuasion aimed at converting others. And so it's an inversion of, uh, of what is typically associated with uh, religious freedom. So these perspectival differences are put on full display in recent controversies over conversion in various parts of India. In Tamil Nadu, a story that's currently gaining quite a bit of attention concerns the suicide of a 17-year-old woman studying at a Catholic school in Tanjavur, uh, which is run by nuns. Media outlets put forth starkly contrasting narratives about what led to her suicide. According to sources affi affiliated with the RSS, a militant Hindu organization, the suicide resulted from attempts by a nun to force the young woman to convert to Catholicism. Tamil Nadu's BJP president, K. Anumalai, released a video which purportedly shows evidence of a religious conversion of religious conversions taking place at the school. The video is being used to advocate for a ban on religious conversion in Tamil Nadu. Local Tamil media paint a very different picture. According to news reports that came out in the Tamil media, this was a young woman who suffered from vitiligo and um, dealt with chronic depression. Uh, she had a stepmother who was very abusive. She had a, her own mother had committed suicide, so there's a history of mental health problems in the family. And uh, she did not want to go home to an abusive mother, so she was she didn't want to go home during the holidays. So she um, eventually ended up uh, killing herself by ingesting pesticide. Um, so these are some of the very very sad details coming out of this uh, Tamil Nadu um, conversion case that is still um, being uh, litigated. Another cluster of incidents uh, involving conversion arose in Bangalore in uh, 2021. On uh, September 10th, a mob of Hindus barged into a prayer meeting conducted by a minister in Udupi district's Nitta village in Karnataka. We're talking about two to 300 uh, Hindus going into a church uh, occupied by about 12 Christians uh, conducting a prayer meeting. Um, they meet up. Um, several of the devotees and violated a woman, according to the minister. Um, and instead of holding the perpetrators accountable, an FIR filed by the police after the incident accused the minister of deliberately outraging the religious feelings of Hindus. He has since, the, the pastor has since been evicted from two rental properties owned by, uh, by landowners and forced to rent a house about 37 kilometers from the church where he uh, conducts his work. On December 23rd, a Hindu, Hindu vigilante group entered a convent school in Karnataka's Mandya district and interrupted a small Christian celebration. Uh, I'm quoting Al Jazeera here, they shouted at the teachers 
and ordered them to stop the celebration, accusing them of converting Hindu children to Christianity. And all of this is taking place in a state that is ruled, uh, governed by the BJP, and is in the process of advancing an anti-conversion bill in uh, Karnataka, something that I'll come back to. The language of these bills um, is, is, is actually quite important. So I was looking for different videos to show in this presentation, and there's so much to choose from. NDTV and Al Jazeera are probably giving this topic the most attention. This is a particular video clip um, involving um, several people that were talking about the events in uh, Bangalore. And one of them is uh, Manipali, Anwar Manipali, who is the BJP spokesman in um, Karnataka, who actually came forth and said uh, that the vigilante policing has to stop that, to his credit. And actually the commentator gave him credit for saying, you know, that's good that you agree with this. Um, but then he went on to say the Christians need to meet the government and really talk extensively about their conversion activities and uh, what is problematic about them. And so he was being pushed on this by the other uh, people on the panel. And so there is one other, a third cluster of events in recent times that has gained quite a bit of attention. And that has to do with the burning of effigies of Santa Claus in um, Delhi and Agra uh, around Christmas time, the chanting of Santa Claus Mundabad, uh, down with Santa Claus. Um, and so um, on Christmas Eve, members um, reportedly belonging to the uh, Bajrandal and other right wing groups set an effigy of Santa Claus on fire in the middle of the street of Agra, uh, sh shouting Santa Claus Mundabad. According to a report in India today, this was a protest against using the ruse of Santa Claus during Christmas time. The main instigator appears to be one Baju Chohan, who, reported, who reportedly said, Santa Claus does not come bearing any gifts. His own only goal is to convert Hindus to Christianity. It's not going to work anymore. Any attempt at conversion will not be allowed to succeed. If this is not stopped, then there will be agitations at missionary schools. The same Aju Chohan expressed profuse public support in 2017 for the burning alive of a Muslim laborer, Muhammad Afrazal, for alleged love jihad, a scenario where a Muslim man uh, supposedly woos and marries a non-Muslim woman in order to convert her to Islam. In both cases, we see Chohan claiming some form of manipulation. Whereas Christians induce conversion with material leverage, Muslims seduce conversion with hypermasculinity. That's how the uh, narrative goes. These, uh, this language, according to Laura Jenkins, a political scientist at Cincinnati, are among the master plots that steer contemporary campaigns against conversion. In both instances, the agency of converts for women is, um, is a face. So contemporary events such as these, along with attempts to ban conversions are clearly inspired by a particular imagination shaped by aspirations for a Hindu Rashtra in India. Within this imagination, the liberal constitution of India is seen as a problem because it benefits, according to San Karvar, minorities, it benefits minorities to the detriment of the majority. Article 25 protects the freedom to profess, practice, and propagate religion. Hindutva advocates believe that this provision underwrites aggressive forms of proselytizing and has placed Hinduism in danger. These sentiments help explain the vilification of Christianity and Islam by the song two transnational and so-called Abrahamic religions whose adherents are portrayed as belonging to a foreign religion and in need of either reconversion or forcible containment. It would be a mistake, however, to suppose that intense feelings about conversion are a recent phenomenon arising only in the context of Hindutva. A closer look at the prehistory of India's conversion debate and its oft repeated tropes allows us to revisit the present with clearer lenses. 
These insights from the past help us understand and perhaps address some of the confusion about conversion. Incidentally, there's a book called The Confusion Called Conversion uh, by a man named uh, Sundaraj. I don't want to plagiarize his book title, so I tweaked that one word. <laughs> so now I'm clear. Give due credit where credit is due. So where does this confusion about conversion come from? I would like to argue that it comes from mapping categories and images of the past onto the present in ways that distort what is happening on the ground. Um, so we're talking about legacy of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of foreign missions that, that go back to the early 19th century. Images and concepts derived from the legacy of foreign missionaries are being mapped onto a contemporary socio-political landscape. Old concepts and categories are being introduced in ways that obscure or distort uh, what is happening uh, with the demise of liberal democracy in India. The attack on the protections um, uh, that exist for minorities. So I'd like to discuss two aspects of the missionary legacy that continue to frame today's conversion debate. And one of them is the image of the um, of the evangelical preacher and polemicist who attacks other religions in public. This is a very a prominent image that arises from the evangelical missionary movement in early 19th century India, especially before the Great Rebellion of 1857. <clears throat> um, they became much more tame after the, the Great Rebellion, but during before the Great Rebellion, there was this evangelical movement that uh, inclined people to go into the public sphere and pop off about other religions, criticize other religions, engage in Lunazaras and Bahas and uh, other sorts of uh, forums where they debated and tried to um, attack other religions. And the second aspect of the missionary legacy I want to draw attention to relates to the language of sincerity, sincerity and authenticity in conversion. Where does that language come from, especially among Dalit and tribal converts? And then the final uh, point that I will make is that these two aspects of the missionary legacy are being mapped onto Pentecostalism. Uh, in India today, the Pentecostal movement, which is the fastest growing um, Christian movement in South Asia, but also the fastest growing religion in the world, according to Harvey Cox and uh, a report uh, by the Pulitzer Center uh, has also identified Pente Pentecostalism as the fastest growing religion in the world today. So let's start, take it from the top and uh, draw your attention to uh, this, this history of polemics, education, and conversion. So during the 19th century, missionaries developed a very confrontational style of interacting with India's religious traditions, an approach that combined a fervent belief in the Bible with ideas of reason and evidence derived from the European Enlightenment. Missionaries typically chose some of the most crowded venues for open air preaching and to attack local beliefs. Pilgrimage sites, bazaars, prominent temples or mosques became venues for very aggressive preaching. These 19th century methods were accompanied by what might be called a knowledge producing apparatus. Printing presses, Bible translations, printed tracts and treatises about other religions were disseminated into an evolving public sphere. They also engaged in debates where they tried to refute the beliefs of uh, adherents of other religions. Now, the point in drawing up this history is simply to point out that Christians today can easily be perceived as occupying the space of the 19th century polemicists who openly attacked other religions. Before examining whether this may or may not be a reasonable attribution, it's important to rec recognize that Indians in the early 19th century did not sit, remain passive when these attacks were happening. They actively opposed missionaries and they defended their beliefs publicly and they engaged in counterattacks on missionaries. And in the process um, of pushing back and defending their beliefs, <clears throat> they uh, contributed to a growing awareness among um, different religious groups of their identities. People became more self-aware 
more self-conscious of religious differences. And so they engaged in a process of co-construction of public religious identities through this uh, process of debate and rational examination of religion. This uh, framework of rational critical debate and reasoning also shaped what was taught in missionary schools and colleges. Scottish missionaries such as John Muir, John Wilson, or William Hasty devoted themselves to education as a means of converting India's elites in hopes that their influence would trickle down to reach the masses. These methods yielded very few converts, but elicited outsized reactions of Hinduism being endangered. Recent uh, study by Mo Banerjee, she's compiled some statistics, um, has noted that over the span of 20 years, government and missionary schools and colleges produced a total of only 107 converts. These triggered alarmist rhetoric from members of uh, the Hindu public, of Hinduism in danger, while converts came to be stigmatized or vilified even within family networks. Missionaries amassed information about other religions, hoping to convert elites to their faith and thereby influencing the masses. By and large, it was not the elites who converted to Christianity. Uh, as you probably know, the largest number of converts came from the, um, the Dalit communities, so-called untouchables of India, were the ones who converted through what were called mass conversions. And these um, mass conversions be uh, became susceptible to another critique um, and that critique relates to this issue of whether these conversions were sincere or authentic, or whether they were motivated by uh, a desire for material benefits from the missionaries. This is another um, aspect of the missionary, missionary legacy that is being mapped onto the present. So the point I want to make in talking about uh, this excellent book by Rupa Vishwanath mm -hmm. is that um, the language of induced or in, inauthentic conversion originates in missionary discourse as a part of a self-critique. Um, it originates in missionary discourse and it's eventually adopted by opponents of the missionary movement and opponents of conversion. Um, and uh, an, an important context that gives rise to this, this authenticity language, as uh, Vishwanath observes, is landlord-laborer relations in, in Tamil Nadu, in, in the Madras presidency. Uh, landlords fear that Christian conversions would incline um, Dalit groups to abandon their hereditary occupations, seek refuge or employment from missionaries, and eventually ultimately reduce access of landlords to a cheap and steady supply of labor. And so in order to stem the tide of these conversions, these landlords launched these assaults on missionaries and claimed that these conversions were illegitimate and insincere. Uh, as a way of discrediting them. So they also responded with very severe acts of violence, when simply discrediting them and saying this is insincere, this is bogus and rice conversions, but they, they attacked these, these converts. And, uh, and so all of this masked their real concern, according to Vishwanath, about losing their steady supply of slave labor. Because of her focus on the issue of pariah slave labor, Vishwanath prefers to discard altogether the notion of conversion when talking about uh, Dalits. The word conversion has so much baggage associated with religion uh, and religious motives, whether, whether conversion is spiritual, whether conversion is material. Vishwanath then prefers um, to, folk, to, to talk about alliances that pariahs formed with missionaries because their main incentive related to ameliorating their, their terrible conditions as, as slaves. And so that being their main, uh, their main motivation was to ameliorate this condition of, of abject slavery. They approached the missionaries hoping that this, this alliance would, would, would kick up resources that would alter their, their conditions. And it may or may not have had anything to do with um, religion per se, according to Vishwanath. So I would agree with Vishwanath that these pariah landlord relations are one context where authenticity language emerges, but it goes way back before that. 
uh, Catholics, like going back to the 16th century, uh, were, were surprised by the number of fishermen that wanted to convert to Catholicism all at once. And uh, when faced with tens of thousands of uh, these fisher folk that wanted to become Catholic, the Catholic missionaries conducted tests of sincerity to see if they knew what they were actually doing when they underwent baptism. And that's what they were called, they're tests of sincerity. And so you can even trace it back farther to the uh, Inquisition in the Iberian Peninsula, where you, you couldn't tell if, uh, if a Moor or a Jew actually converted to Catholicism because they're secretly hiding their, their real ethnic self, their real religious self. So were they sincere Catholics or were they you know, hiding this? Uh, so this sincerity language, this authenticity language has a, a long lineage going back to the, perhaps the, the institution of the Inquisition. Um, so it's not a 19th, 20th century thing. So another venue, another context in which the language of sincerity and authenticity arose was among the churas of the Punjab. This was a Dalit group that um, navigated between the dominant religious traditions of the Northwest. They worshiped at Hindu, Muslim, and Sikh shrines, along with those of their own deities. A recent study by Joel Lee points out that during the 19th century, uh, Turas did not understand themselves to be either Hindu or Muslim. And members of those communities did not recognize Churas as belonging to their folds. It was only during the 20th century, when the with the introduction of communal electorates, that Churas were counted as Hindu. So their practices, the religious practices of the Churas were eclectic. They were layered. They had in the, the, the imprints of many different religious traditions on them. And so it's very difficult to classify them uh, in one religion or another. During the late 19th, early 20th century, there was a mass movement of conversion to Christianity among the Churas. But even when they converted en masse to Christianity, um, it did not resolve this this condition of hybridity among the churas. Missionaries were vexed by this project of trying to constitute a Christian subject, a proper Christian subject among the chura convert. Uh, they, they were complaining that these folks were constantly backsliding and were constantly lapsing into old practices when in fact, this was the space that they actually naturally inhabited is this, this space of, uh, of uh, of, of moving back and forth between these different traditions. So this uh, frustration comes to the surface in these missionary reports rather pointedly, especially in the Punjab uh, with, with the Churas. Um, and there was uh, um, one missionary, uh, Hervey DeWitt Griswold, who sometimes portrayed the Churas as intellectually incapable of understanding the new faith of not having the intellectual capacity to become a doctrinally informed Christian. And so he conducted a study um, that noted the difference between baptism and communion. Baptism is, uh, they're both markers of Christian identity, but baptism is an entry into the Christian fold. But communion is reserved for those who really understand the deeper tenets of the faith. So there was this gap between when you baptize someone and when you permit them to take communion. And he did a, this elaborate study of how long of a delay is required before you can allow a jura to take communion. And it was something at least six months. But what is most striking about DeWitt's lang Griswold's language is the condescension and the disparaging ways he represented the jura. Uh, if baptism marked their entry, uh, let me see the quote here. Um, yeah. Baptism marks the Chura as Christians as a lumber company marks their logs. Griswold likened the baptism of mass converts in India to infant baptism in European Christian traditions. So they're like infants. It's infantilizing uh, discourse comes out of uh, the missionary. Both involved classes of people who apparently lacked the cognitive ability to grasp what they were doing. This different way of baptism and communion represented the difference between a merely nominal Christian identity and a more authentic one. 
And of course, this uh, discourse of this infantilizing uh, paternalistic discourse is one that was taken up by Gandhi in his own way of approaching uh, the people he called the Harijans, uh, the, his name for the Dalits or the untouchables. Um, Gandhi emphasized the ignorance of Dalits. He described Pulayas and Pariahs as having paralyzed intelligence, almost like he was quoting Griswold or something like that. Um, to even attempt to convert them, exploited their ignorance and was not true Christianity. Perhaps none of Gandhi's statements concerning the cognitive facilities of Dalits elicited greater consternation than his um, likening them to cows. Um, you, 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 uh, the majority of uh, Harijans, he said, can, be, can no more understand the presentation of Christianity than my cows. And this, uh, obviously, uh, if you read on Bedkar, uh, elicited a very fiery response from them, Bedkar. So, um, Gandhi's describing um, Dalits in much the same way as Griswold did, and you would expect that Gandhi and Griswold could get together and give each other a big, a big high five. I mean, is it, what, what, where's the disagreement? Where's the conflict? <laughs> very, very similar language. Um, but Gandhi took the missionary idiom of authenticity and channeled, channeled it into an entirely different space. And um, it was one that maintained that people remain fixed in the religious identity of their birth. In the case of Dalits or Harijans, as he called them, he believed this identity to be Hindu. And once a Hindu, always a Hindu. And so if you convert to another religion, it's a fictional move. It's a fictional move. And you have to be brought back. And this was something that is developed very, very extensively in the writings of Gandhi. And if you ever wanted to research uh, Gandhi's writings about Christian conversion, it's all compiled into one one book, all of his writings about Christianity, Christian missions, their place in India, which almost becomes a text that influences the discourse of anti-conversion uh, for decades to come. Uh, the Christian Missions Enquiry Commission, or the Niyogi Report, that was uh, uh, delivered in the 1950s, draws extensively on Gandhi's notion of an induced, uh, manipulated conversion. So once you're born into this space, this is where you belong. And if you move from that space, it is an artificial move. It, you need to be brought back. He's so convinced of this that he has this exchange with a member of the Arya Samaj, um, who um, it's a reform, Hindu reformist uh, organization that is uh, committed to reforming Hinduism, but also bringing people back into the fold of Hinduism, uh, especially in the Punjab. And uh, a question was asked, um, should we perform the rite of purification, should we, on the Christian uh, converts to bring them back? And Gandhi said, no, 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 it's not necessary because they're inauthentic convert converts to begin with. They're not even real. The conversion is not even real. So you don't have to readmit them. You just, just bring them along. You don't have to perform the uh, should be at all. Um, so this is the, uh, the Gandhian uh, discourse um, that relates to um, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the conversion issue, I want to turn now to how these discourses are mapped onto the present, particularly in connection to Pentecostal um, preaching and Pentecostal practices in contemporary India, and how they lay, uh, lend themselves to justifications of acts of violence against Pentecostals. So what can we say about uh, Pentecostalism? Pentecostalism is a form of Christianity placing a strong emphasis on the role of the Holy Spirit and the need for what they call Holy Spirit baptism. Pentecostalism stresses the role of supernatural forces in everyday life and maintains that Christ is manifest supernaturally in the speaking of foreign tongues, miraculous healing, ecstasy, and deliverance from evil spirits. It is a denomination, there is a Pentecostal denomination called the Assemblies of God, but more often than not, uh, it's a form of Christian spirituality, often sometimes referred to as Pentecostalized spirituality, that proliferates at the grassroots level, has no organizational denominational confines, it just moves in a decentralized way, especially into villages, the tribal areas. 
and so it might not have any ties at all to worldwide denominational networks or resources. Harvey Cox, uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, identifies this as the fastest growing religion in the world. Pentecostalism can be a very urban phenomenon. It can also be um, a movement that impacts villages and rural areas as well. There is a grandiosity and a megalomania associated with Pentecostalism that uh, has produced these mega churches uh, throughout the world. Uh, Yoido Full Gospel Church, uh, boasts of a membership of some 800,000 people, 500,000 people, astronomical figures. Uh, this is a very large megachurch in, um, in Hyderabad, Calvary Temple, um, outdoor healing meeting in Chennai. So you do have this uh, mega-sized discourse in Pentecostalism that many people would find very threatening uh, and conjuring up this notion of religious competition, competition of numbers, the numbers game, um, quite understandably. But this dimension of Pentecostalism is primarily urban. And most of the attacks against Pentecostals are usually in villages, according to a study by Chad Bowman, recent study by Chad Bowman. Um, so I want to turn to Chad Bowman's study. Um, of anti-Christian violence. Um, most anti-Christian violence um, is directed against Pentecostal or Pentecostalized churches. And Bowman says it's because of a rhetoric that is deployed by Pentecostals, what he calls the rhetoric of rupture, that becoming a Christian entails a shock break from your past and a repudiation of your previous religion. And uh, Bowman says that this language of rupture, accompanied by aggressive preaching, the language of spiritual warfare, uh, which is uh, part of the vocabulary of Pentecostalism, brings on anti-Christian violence. And Bowman is careful to point out it doesn't legitimize the violence, but it helps contextualize the violence. So at one level, Bowman's observations make sense. And it is easy to map the image of the 19th century proselytizer onto, Pente Pente onto Pentecostalism. But Pentecostals depart from that legacy in some very important ways. 19th century evangelicals used reason debate, education, and Orientalist knowledge to publicly discredit other religions and make a case that Christianity is best suited for modernity. That was the nature of the discourse. At, at that time. Pentecostalism operates within an entirely different framework because of its belief in an enchanted universe and the focus on the supernatural. According to uh, a study by Michael Bergunder, uh, wrote a book on the origins of Pentecostalism in South India, uh, the, the spiritist uh, and emphasis on exorcism uh, suggests that Pentecostalism shares a demonology with village Hinduism. They, they enter the same worldview of, of uh, spirits, spirits that can possess and inhabit bodies, spirits of the dead, spirits associated with local temples. And so uh, Pentecostalism are moving, Pentecostals are moving within that common space, but they assert Christ's supremacy over these local spirits. And exorcism and the casting out of these spirits is a very big part of of the, the goods that Pentecostals deliver in these uh, village settings. <clears throat> in many respects, this resembles the practice of Pentecostalism in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, where uh, the difference between a Pentecostal African, uh, a Nigerian, and a traditional African Nigerian is not that they have this different worldview, but that the cross being wielded by the uh, Christian, the Pentecostal, is more powerful than the <clears throat> witch doctor's uh, tools. And that's the nature of the combat. And this is the different space that is occupied by the Pentecostal. So um, Pentecostalism also draws poor and marginal classes of people to its music, its charismatic and emotional preaching, its emphasis on miracles, physical healing, tangible experiences of the divine, and prominent roles for women in the practice of churches. 
And so there's been a steady exodus of people from mainline traditional churches <coughs> in the, into Pentecostal and Pentecostalized forms of uh, practices in India. Uh, even um, members of the, the oldest church in India, the Syrian uh, Christians, the Syrian Marathoma church, have seen a steady flow of people out of the Syrian Christian tradition into Kerala's Pentecostal churches. It's just a very well-documented uh, trajectory. Services, uh, yeah, they have services that purportedly break down caste barriers. Even in urban settings, you have the urban core coming to Pentecostal churches, mixing and mingling with more middle-class folk in these churches. So it's quite the opposite of 19th century preachers who attacked um, other religions with reasoned arguments, but made very few converts. And it raises the question of uh, what is at stake and what is the basis of the hostility directed against Pentecostalism? It's one thing to say that Pentecostals are attacked because they attack others uh, through this rhetoric of rupture. But it's quite another thing, and perhaps more accurate to say, that Pentecostals are attacked precisely because they attract. They attract people to their, their movement. And this raises the question of uh, whether the real issue that's at stake is the fear of a potentially growing demographic, which reflects the demographic transformation that has occurred elsewhere in the global south. Latin American Pentecostalism, Sub-Saharan African Pentecostalism, South Korean Pentecostalism are very, very rapidly growing movements. So the fear that something like that could be recreated in South Asia, perhaps is bringing on the attacks that we're, we're observing. The other question that comes out of uh, the Pentecostal movement and the kinds of goods that are, are delivered by Pentecostals and the claim that these goods are inducements for conversion is whether you can quantify affective goods, the emotional appeal of Pentecostalism, of uh, dancing in a church, of, 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 of jumping around, of having ecstatic experiences, of speaking in, in tongues, of hearing this music and uh, having a sense of belonging. Is this an inducement to conversion? Uh, and are you able to quantify that in any tangible way in an anti-conversion bill? Um, so these are some of the questions that come out of of, of these of Pentecostal, the Pentecostal movement is, and it problematizes the mapping of these polemics and uh, inducement arguments from the early 19th century onto Pentecostalism. I just want to conclude quickly with by referencing the uh, Karnataka Freedom of Religion Bill. And you can look at the amount of attention that is devoted to um, the concept, the definition of allurement. It's just a long list of things that um, uh, that go into being an alluring religion. Any gift or gratification, easy money, material benefit, employment, free education, in a school or college, promise to marry, better lifestyle, divine displeasure, otherwise. Um, and a lot of this is lifted from earlier anti-conversion bills. But you can see that the, the notion of allurement is very far reaching. And it's going to be very difficult to prove that someone was not allured into becoming a convert if the, the definition is that broad. The other aspect of this bill, which is different from other anti-conversion bills, is that it does not outlaw converting back to the original religion. So the Gaudwapsi campaigns that are, are at work in many different parts of India to convert, reconvert Muslims and Christians back to Hinduism are perfectly legitimate according to the legal standards that are being put forth in these laws. So let's see if they hold up in court and at the Supreme Court green lights them. So these uh, developments in India today, going back to the uh, suicide and going back to uh, Santa Claus and um, suggest that um, conversion is not simply an issue that relates to Dalits and tribals. Once you start tampering with Santa Claus or tampering with the consumer, uh, class, uh, a middle class uh, phenomenon. And so Christians in the middle classes are being attacked as well, which raises a broader question of citizenship. Uh, if, 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 if you're only talking about Dalits and tribals, you're talking about people that belong to a, 
Partha Chatterjee calls political society, people that are excluded from civil society, but belong, are, 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 are by the de jure citizens of India, but are not real participants and partakers of the protections of the constitution, the benefits of citizenship. But once you start talking about somebody who is a middle-class person who uh, gives gifts at Christmas time and, and has Santa Claus, it, it, it signifies the possibility that the attacks are extending to broader classes of people. Not, so, not that we should be so concerned about the middle-class subject and not concerned about the tribals that are being attacked, but it raises these larger um, questions of, of uh, citizenship um, that are affecting many different classes of people. These relate to a larger crisis occurring in India and around the globe, um, the emergence of the far right in politics and the demise of liberal democracies. Um, summing up here, the mapping, uh, mapping 19th century discourses onto contemporary India provides a pretext for the whittling away of rights and protections guaranteed to minorities under the Indian constitution. Just as acts of violence can undermine citizenship, marginal groups can respond by engaging in what uh, Jason Keith Fernandez calls citizenship acts, uh, acts that um, consolidate their presence and register their presence um, on the political landscape, on the national landscape. Citizenship acts, uh, um, Christians, Muslims, tribals, and Dalits share a common plight in the face of Hindutva, and only time will tell as to whether they can find ways of reinvigorating uh, India's constitutional framework in order to ensure their protection and their flourishing. So I'll stop there. Interesting, fascinating. Uh, you, you talked about Mo's work, Mo Banerjee's work, mm -hmm. and one of the things that Mo showed that, that despite the small numbers, yeah. the anxiety was enormous. So I wondered, I mean, what's the volume of conversion to Pentecostalism in India? I mean, you know, what are we talking about numbers? And the second question is, is whether there is a perceived transnational or global link uh, to Pentecostalism right. in India. Certainly. So I'd like to hear both. Right. In terms of the numbers, it's very hard to quantify because yeah. the census is uh, our only official word on how much Christianity is growing, uh, how much any particular class is growing. Um, but if, if the trajectory in India resembles the trajectory in other parts of the global south, the Pentecostals are the only ones who actively propagate their faith uh, and are committed to it. And so the other denominations, more mainline, are much more cautious, much more um, sedentary in terms of how they uh, understand Christian practices. But Pentecostalism is central to just go out and, and, and share and to propagate in these particular ways. So I would suspect that their trajectory is much more pronounced <laughs> than the trajectories of other groups. But I don't have that the numbers on my fingertips. But I think it's accessible. But it's usually accessible through uh, Christian uh, groups that are counting uh, converts, uh, not accessible through census, official census. I did find out that um, the numbers of Christians in Karnataka have actually declined from 2001 to 2011, which is why the bishop of Karnataka is saying, why, the, why, why all the anger, why all the you know, hysteria about conversions when our numbers have actually gone down? Um, and so those are interesting. The, the perception of Pentecostals being globally connected is very, very valid because they are connected through media networks. They have three major broadcasting companies that are projecting worldwide Pentecostal preaching into Indian channels. That's been going on for a very long time. Um, whether or not they are accessing large sums of money through these networks um, is another question altogether. Uh, probably some, especially in the urban settings where you have these big, very large structures. It's hard to imagine that that's being constructed entirely by uh, Indian contributions. So there's, there is this sense in which um, the globality of, of Pentecostalism is coming into play in terms of uh, fanning, fomenting this suspicion that it's a foreign, it's foreign, foreign induced. Uh, but this is a very live uh, conversation in world Christianity literature. Thank you. Yeah.
Yeah. Could you just introduce yourself? Sure, sure. Uh, I'm Robin. I'm a student at the Flesh School. Uh, my question is actually a little bit on the follow up on the numbers part. Yeah. I'm curious about uh, in the growth, in the conversion, the interfaith versus the intrafaith conversion, especially as you touched upon the Syrian Christians. Uh, and, and on that part, uh, in the attractions of Pentecostalism, one thing that I felt missing was the material promises, the prosperity part of it. Right. I'm wondering in the interior, intra versus inter, which plays, uh, I mean, where does it play a much of a bigger role? Good, good. Much of the literature on Pentecostalism in South Asia emphasizes the intra, meaning they're moving from one Christian group to another. And they're drawn to Pentecostalized spirituality, which is more of a religion of the heart, and it's more emotive, and a more tangible experience of spirit of supernatural um, experience of uh, events and, and presences. And so, um, in terms of uh, prosperity, gospel is also something that is predominant in the urban settings in urban contexts. The kinds of uh, preaching that take place in the villages, we're talking about pastors riding motorcycles out into these areas by themselves and conducting services among groups of people. We're not talking about a big, huge gathering like the image that I showed you. Uh, we're talking about small scale kinds of propagation that might catch on when um, converts in the tribals begin to uh, transmit uh, their religion to others. But um, prosperity gospel is a huge aspect of Pentecostal preaching, and, and, and it is at work uh, in, I, I, in, in, in South Asian contexts. Uh, and there's a big debate about prosperity teaching, whether um, it warrants the kind of criticism that it often brings. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the criticism is it's easy for, it's easy for you to say that you should not promise wealth to a person that you don't belong to the class of people that aspires to be uh, to be wealthy you have wealth uh, and so uh, it goes back and forth in terms of uh, prosperity uh, preaching and its, and its legitimacy as a form of allurement to uh, pentecostal movements uh, another interesting debate is about the appeal the relative appeal of liberation theology and Pentecostalism. Um, the oft-cited uh, cliche is that liberation theology opted for the poor, but the poor opted for Pentecostalism. And that's um, something that explains the different trajectories of, of these, these, these practices in Latin America. Yeah. Um, do you want to go? Oh, okay. uh, my name is Walter. I'm also at the Fletcher School. And uh, I know in among um, Christian missionaries in China, it was seen that the turn against um, syncretic beliefs where Christian beliefs and uh, Chinese folk beliefs were mixed together. Yeah. Uh, when Jesuits started moving against that, that was sort of a high watermark for Christianity mm -hmm. and it never quite reached those heights again. Did a similar thing happen in India? Because you were saying that there were these people who kind of moved fluidly between beliefs, right? Um, and did the attempt to stop that limit Christianity's appeal at all? Um, that's a great question. Uh, and the simple answer is, I, I'm not sure um, what the impact that there have always been um, attempts by missionaries and people uh, in, in, leader, in, in leadership in Christian movements to eradicate um, syncretisms of various kinds, mixtures. There's been a discomfort with mixtures in the history of, of many different religious traditions. Uh, a, a quest for purity of doctrine and uh, purity of practice. And um, that can definitely impede um, growth, especially among illiterate peoples that just don't know what a doctrinally uh, clean uh, Bill of health looks like that would come through literacy. Um, and so um, I can see the logic of what you're saying is definitely playing itself out. I think the comparison between China and South Asia is fascinating because it's very similar uh, in terms of how um, you know the, the imperial legacy um, has impacted 
Christians in both contexts and how, again, these old discourses are mapped onto the present. Um, and uh, the, the, the emergence of house churches in China um, as a venue of syncretic practice. It's, it's just so many things happen in these so-called unregistered churches that uh, reflect the mixtures of the old and the new. <clears throat> it's the registered churches that are monitored by the government and <laughs> they're told what they can believe and what they can't preach about. Uh, and so um, I think you have similar dynamics, but not exactly the same in India. Yeah. Um, my name is Daniel, I'm a history of uh, your house. Um, thank you very much for this talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I think there, I, my question is about gender and I want to sort of specifically reference a couple things that you talked about and, and ask you to address them or uh, unpack whether there are genderizing elements um, or the role of gender in, in um, conversion. And so there's obviously the Tamil Nadu um, suicide case. Uh, you talked about hypermasculinity in this in the Santa Claus case as well. And if you go back, I think to the slide on on the gospel, you see this very explicit, right. you know, resonant picture of this this woman and women behind her um, in this affective emotional pose. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, what is the genderizing role there? Is are there female preachers who are preaching to this crowd? Right. What what is how, what role does gender play in this process? Yeah, it's prominent actually, uh, and you know. The, the role of women as bearers of spiritual traditions of family and uh, the so-called interior domain that Prime Chatterjee talks about is quite quite significant in terms of explaining uh, the prominence of women in the, in the dissemination of Pentecostalism, Pentecostal practices. Uh, Pentecostalism is fiercely dem democratic and democratizing <laughs> in its impulses, uh, and so it draws grassroots people into its, its, its movements and its practices. And it also says that everyone can have the Holy Spirit. Uh, men and women can have the Holy Spirit and can actually uh, administer um, the gifts of the Spirit to others. And so there's this excellent book that is not about uh, Protestant Pentecostals, but it's about Catholicism uh, called uh, Possessed by the Virgin. Possessed by the Virgin by Kristen Bloomer. Um, I signed it this semester, actually, and I have to read it by tomorrow. I've <laughs> <laughs> read most of it. But uh, it talks about the prominence of the Virgin Mary in, in Catholic practices in, in South India and the belief that the Virgin Mary actually inhabits um, some women who, in the, the power of Mary, begin to touch others and, and conduct healings. But this is what I would call a very Pentecostalized practice. Pentecostals may not believe that it's the Virgin Mary that inhabit them. They are inhabited by uh, spiritual powers that allow them to administer healing uh, through the power of touch to others. Um, so women can touch women, and men typically cannot touch, touch women context of, of Pentecostal churches in the same ways. Um, and so this creates you know, a different space for, for women to be active agents in, um, in Pentecostal practices. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, there is a comment by Joseph Howard in the chat, if you oh. can access it. Or if you want, I can read I it out. Uh, Joseph is saying there was a Malabar rights controversy in India similar to the Chinese rights controversy. In both cases, the Jesuits were chastised for their syncretic tendencies, and the Jesuits were ultimately suppressed in the late 18th century. Right. Good. That's true. Okay. <laughs> um, I also have a question. Yeah. Um, so I was curious if uh, under colonial conversions, any changes in the clothing systems for women took took place, uh, and I'm trying to also compare this with um, how the missionaries were uh, operating in Kenya, especially mm. with women's education. They were ha first handing out pieces of cloth to them. Ah. And then by the 1920s, they also started giving them sewing machines. Right. So I, I, I was curious if yeah. we had- Dress is a hugely important uh, dimension to um, indices of change in converts, that when somebody becomes a convert from, um, an untouchable background, 
uh, the signifiers of that transformation is an alteration of dress. And I'm sure that it's, it's gendered in some way. Um, in one of my earlier books, I talk about um, a court case involving a convert. And a critical question that's asked in the court case is at what point did they abandon the native dress and adopt the West, Western dress? And that was extended both to men and to women in the question. Um, as, as a signifier of the transformation. And um, you had mentioned something else in the question um, about. Um, uh, so, yeah, I was just curious if, you know, there were these um, deliberate uh, movements, you know, from handing over cloth to in, encouraging them right, uh, right. To, to start sewing their own yeah. clothes as an exchange for the education that these missionary institutions were giving, giving to the women. So do we see similar or maybe comparative uh, formulations in the yeah. You know, uh, that doesn't surprise <laughs> me if there was a little bit of quid pro quo in the sense that, uh, you know, if you want to come to this missionary school, you should dress properly and there is a dress code uh, for these, uh, these schools and there's, uh, the, that these would be uh, defined in a, gender, a very gendered sort of way. Um, the where you also have the issue of dress being brought up is in the so-called dress cloth controversies where uh, Dalit women were required to be uncovered and um, <coughs> upon <coughs> conversion, they would want to wear the same top that the Syrian Christian women wore. Uh, there's a woman, this scholar named Sonia Thomas, who has written a book called uh, Privileged Minorities that talks about this controversy in some detail as it pertains to cloth, cloth among the, the Syrian Christians and what it signifies. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you. My name is Hassan Dovid. I'm also a Fletcher student and I'm from Bangladesh. Thank you for your very informative, detailed talk. And I can relate some stories with Bangladesh ah, also. Yeah. There are much more disparate conversion happened in 70s and 80s after the independence, mostly in the poor people and the Dalit uh, people. Yeah. And two of the most largest business companies, those, those actually are the converted ah. Christians, the Square Group, the Square Pharmaceuticals, and all these things. And people have a perception that if someone converted, they get so many property, wealth, okay. big business. Right. And there are several NGOs. Yeah. Those are actually converted uh, Christian families. Right. Uh, but uh, Bangladesh, in Bangladesh, there is no act like this that we, uh, we have the feeling that every religion has its right to promote their religion. And we are mostly one, probably the one of the limited countries who celebrate the birthdays of the main character of all four religion, ah. like the uh, Gautam yeah. Buddha, Buddha ah. Purnima, uh, Jesus Christ, right. uh, Christmas, uh, Sri Krishna's John Mashtomi, and Idun Yadun Nabi of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But there are like 64,000 NGOs working in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And thousands are philanthropic organizations and most are the Christian organizations. Mm -hmm. So there are act and uh, monitoring that uh, no service or support can be rendered in exchange of right. forcing them uh, to uh, manipulate their religion or political beliefs. Yeah. And uh, also there are so many missionary schools and colleges yeah. which are very good in quality. People uh -huh. all can go there, yeah. but they have some sort of promoting okay. their religion right. and getting chances to that school colleges are very difficult right. for other people but if someone is christian Ooh. it's very easy for them Ooh. and also regarding the construction of churches Ooh. we we have churches even from the portuguese churches Ooh. from uh, hundreds of years before and also the second largest south asian church in Natur in Boraigram and the entire village, those are converted Christians. Ah. So I think it's a very uh, good topic and uh, all the regions should promote by themselves, but right. Right. there should be some sort of uh, <coughs> regulations. Ah. Well, thank you. Thank you for that comparative uh, perspective. I wasn't aware of uh, those guidelines being instituted in Bangladesh. We hear about blasphemy laws in, in Bangladesh more than we hear about the, the kinds of uh, frameworks that you just described. So I appreciate that. Thank you. I have a question. 
Um, uh, you talked about, it was a fascinating talk. Uh, it was very interesting listening to you. Uh, you talked about uh, one point where you mentioned that uh, the poor and marginalized people often get, uh, you know, attracted towards Pentecostalism. And in that way, I have one question in my mind that, uh, do you think that uh, this uh, poor and marginalized people getting attracted towards Pentecostalism, uh, uh, the Pentecostals, on the other hand, sort of try to uh, check in on uh, the, you know, I'm talking about the cause of sincerity and authenticity part, that is there also a check on the part of the Pentecostals on this behavior of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, poor marginalized people getting attracted towards them. This is one. And uh, what is your uh, perspective on that? And uh, number two is like, you talked about this a point, uh, again, on coming on this point, that poor and marginalized, uh, you know, uh, con uh, consists of a vast majority. Yeah. But particularly when you're uh, talking about the South Asian context, right. and in that context, if uh, uh, can you sort of uh, relate it uh, only just uh, as a uh, you know uh, on perspective of India as such, yeah. or you can relate it to other South Asian nations as well? That how uh, this is a right. you know major uh, you know uh, kind of it is about to become a major kind of movement. What's your take on that? Right, sir? right. Um, I, I think it's far from achieving the scale that is seen in Latin America or Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. Sub-Saharan Africa, 31 African countries have Christian majorities now. And most of them are, are some variety of Pentecostalism or African initiated churches as they're often called. Um, so the, the growth of Pentecostalism in South Asia is quite prevalent um, in, in Nepal, for instance, and also in um, Sri Lanka. Um, but they're also, protectionist impulses by these governments to make sure that the dominant religion remains the dominant religion. So Buddhism is the uh, protected, it has a protected status in Sri Lanka. So there are curbs on, on growth of these, these other grassroots movements. Um, and your first question is a very interesting question about whether Pentecostals have tests of sincerity in the same way that earlier <laughs> Christians do. And the, the, the issue with tests of sincerity and authenticity is it was a very cognitive uh, enterprise. It, 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 related to, um, it related to the idea of intellectual assent as central to the adoption of a new religion. Pentecostalism is not fixated on intellectual categories. It's fixated on spirit. And so the real indication that somebody has become a Pentecostal is the speaking of glossolalia, <laughs> the experience of tongues, and the entry into this emotional um, participatory space. Uh, and so it's simply joining the community uh, and, 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 and entering into repeated practice. And there are some catechesis that takes place within Pentecostal churches as well. But it's not from the get-go, this issue with Griswold of, okay, baptism first and wait till, wait till you can take communion is, is just not the, the hoops that you jump through sequentially in a Pentecostal context. It's much more um, oriented to um, non-cognitive criteria. And, and that would be uh, how I would address both of those. Thank you for those questions. There is a question online uh, from Onuwakumi Adisina. Uh, and they ask, is the attack against uh, Pentecostals hinged on their aggressive conversion of Hindus? Uh, is, the, what? is the attack against Pentecostals hinged on their aggressive conversion of Hindus? Okay, um, well, hello to Kemi. She's my other Yang scholar of affordable Christianity at Harvard. Um, I don't think it's um, related to a deliberate uh, concentration on Hindus uh, as it is. It, it's not such a tit for tat. It, 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 I, I think that what, what elicits the, um, the attacks is um, that it's growing in places where it should not grow in these tribal regions. And uh, there's a very important uh, discussion of whether tribal should be considered Hindu at all. Uh, and whether many Dalit communities are Hindu. There's a book called Why I'm Not a Hindu by uh, Kancha Elaya. It's a 1996 publication, but um, the arguments are, 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 are repeated in a lot of Dalit literature. They're not Hindu as their starting point. 
And so the idea that Dalits are becoming uh, Christian or becoming Muslim, um, what, what is their default setting? And, and why do we presume that they start out as Hindu? Um, where, where does that uh, logic come from? So my response would be probably not uh, to, to Kemi's excellent question. Hello again, Kemi. So. <laughs> Uh, my name is Jeff Barson. I'm a chaplain at Harvard University. And uh, Professor Malapali, my question is about reconversion and what the incentives are there. Is it our um, like current Pentecostals, are they being induced in other ways to come back to Hinduism? Is it, is it, or is it just being re-included in their community? Is it avoiding the violence that might come to, to converts to Pentecostalism? Mm -hmm. Why, what is it that draws them to reconvert? Right, yeah, and so this is this whole concept of homecoming, and uh, it is the, um, the need to uh, bring um, Muslims and Christians back into uh, the Hindu fold, which is the starting point, and it goes back to this Gandhian logic that uh, the, authentic, uh, the authentic subjectivity of, of people who are of the soil is Hindu. This is, this is who they are. It's an Indic argument that if you are Indic, if you are of the soil, this is the place where you are to be fixed. This is where your identity is fixed. And so uh, you, you don't reconvert somebody, you bring someone back to what they were originally. And so the vast majority of Muslims in India are products of generations, but they're, they're not foreigners, they're not people who migrated from some other place. Uh, and so the idea is, okay, uh, it was some sort of history of conquest that made them Muslim, so they're not authentically Muslim. Let's just bring them back. Um, and it's the same thing with people that are Christian. Let's, let's just bring them back to their starting point. Um, uh, so the, the, the logic is a restorative logic. It, it, it's not a transformational logic and they are deploying acts of, I mean, using violence, <laughs> using um, uh, inducements like I'm going to, you're going to qualify for SC status, you're going to be given a certain caste status when you come back into Hinduism. Um, I had a student <laughs> just collect all these articles about the um, a few years ago and it's just astonishing what, what kinds of uh, incentives are needed out to facilitate these um, rated versions. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. the, uh, the discussion about tests of sincerity uh, made me think about, uh, again, uh, Mo Banerjee's work, right. where uh, you know, she shows that Bengali elites had an overt rejection, right. but sometimes a covert fascination with Christianity. Yeah. And certainly one of the figures she studies, Ganendra Mohan Tagore, uh, uh, I think showed his sincerity by losing all his property, uh, quite apart from being cut away from uh, the moorings of his family and his uh, erstwhile community. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I wanted to bring you back to where you started, uh, anti-Christian violence particularly anti-Christian uh, violence in Southern India, especially Karnataka. And I can see that, uh, you know, uh, the aggressive missionary activities of the 19th century are getting mapped onto, uh, you know, what is being done against the Pentagon to, uh, uh, onto this now. Uh, but that seems to be a sort of a justification for these sort of attacks, right. you know, trying to, you know, map something that really was something very different, uh, the aggressive uh, proselytizing of uh, Christian missionaries, both against Hinduism and Islam. And again, uh, you know, uh, Aisha's work shows how, in fact, the attacks on the prophet of Islam uh, turned out oh, yeah. to be especially sort of sensitive and, and of course, elicited rebuttals. Yeah. But when we look at anti-Christian violence today, does it really have anything to do with the quality of religious faith or the sort of spirituality associated with Pentecostalism? Because it seems, to, or is it just a matter of majoritarian politics? Yeah. 
Is there any difference, as you see it, when you look at Karnataka today, between what uh, the the BJP is doing with the uh, you know anti-conversion laws, the so-called freedom of religion legislation, uh, and let's say what's going on with uh, uh, the hijab con uh, controversy? It seems to be sort of entirely political and trying to consolidate some kind of a uh, majoritarian sort of Hindu vote mm -hmm. in the one southern state right. where they have got a foothold. Yeah. And therefore you see sort of a kind of effort set polarization, yeah. uh, which leads me to believe that it's now it's not so much a question of Christianity between Hinduism and Islam or Christians yeah. between Hindus and Muslims, right. but in fact, you know, a kind of Hindu majoritarian, uh, you know, consolidation against both uh, Muslims and Christians uh, in the country, you know. So yeah. how much it is, is it simply that majoritarian politics of, of the day uh, rather than, you know, what the Pentecostalist appeal actually might be in religious spiritual terms? I think you're absolutely right in that it, that um, these uh, these devices uh, of induced conversion and uh, uh, attacks on the Hindu religion are staging mechanisms. They're, they're stagings um, that um, that may not be sincere objections to the content of Pentecostal practices, uh, and that they could be simply um, symbolic resources to deploy to um, gain a foothold, a much stronger foothold in Southern. That, that is the political analysis that's certainly very, very, um, it has purchased, especially in the, in the context of Hindutva. I've always thought that these arguments are pretexts for um, the actual onward march of, of uh, the pursuit of a Hindu, a Hindu Rashtra. But the fact that there can be any movement that has the potential for growth and generating excitement and generating um, this grandiosity that I alluded to earlier also factors into this politics of numbers. But this is a politics of numbers before there are any numbers to speak of. <laughs> We're talking about one point, uh, the two point three percent of the population of one point uh, three, one point four billion are Christian, and uh, these are numbers that stay pretty, pretty, pretty stable. So I'm inclined to agree with you that these arguments from the 19th century are pretexts for stagings of anti-Christian um, activity that catalyze the anger um, that, 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 that mobilizes the movement in much the way, same way that we, we, we find Trumpists and, and, and the far right in America always needing some sort of a pretext to, uh, to galvanize its pace. In this space. But it's uh, the opposition to, um, to Christianity and to um, aspects of Islam in India are very real among Hindu middle classes. I mean, it's been internalized. Uh, you can call it drinking of the Kool-Aid or whatever you might want to call it. But it's, it's become a normalized discourse in uh, Hindu middle classes. Whether we want to call that sincerity or whether we want to call it politics is another question altogether. There is a question by, uh, by Joseph Howard, and I'll read that out for you. Given the connection you've drawn between Pentecostalism today and evangelical uh, missionaries in the 19th century, would you say that the spread of Pentecostalism feels like a continuation of European colonial invasion? My impression from studying Christianity in India is that before the arrival of the Portuguese, Indian Christians existed relatively peacefully with their non-Christian neighbors. If interreligious dynamics in India today are characterized by the tensions reinforced by the British categorization, does this support the colonization of consciousness thesis? Hmm. Uh, well, my answer to that question is no, I'm not drawing a, a, a direct lineage be between the early 19th century and the Pentecostal. Matter of fact, I'm trying to say that they inhabit entirely different um, discursive spaces, uh, but that the old is being mapped onto the new by those who want to find a pretext for attacking them. 
but that doesn't mean that actually that they are they're drawing from that that heritage and extending that heritage themselves. Um, yeah, I'm aware of the fact that Thomas Christians predate the arrival of Europeans and that they have this, this, this history of coexistence, which uh, is very rich and it, it warrants further, further consideration. But there's also a steady exodus of Thomas Christians into, into Pentecostalism. And so there's this question of whether they are in any sense retrieving something that was lost or gaining something that their tradition did not um, is not delivering in, in, in the contemporary context. Well, I think, uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, that was a really fascinating, I think the conversation continues. Uh, Certainly.